We welcome you to the Maleficati Asante Institute in Philadelphia, uh, 5535 Germantown Avenue. We are delighted to have you with us, uh, those of you who are here physically and those of you who are with us on YouTube. Uh, we are very fortunate today, uh, as uh, many times we have some of the most outstanding uh, speakers uh, in the world. Uh, come through here, and today we have one of those. We're just really excited. Uh, uh, we have uh, Dr. Rinaldo Anderson, who is, uh, as we have stated, an eminent scholar in the field of Afrofuturism. And a lot of people don't know what Afrofuturism is. Well, you're going to learn today. Uh, he is a, a chief uh, intellectual in this field, He's known not just here in the United States, but he's known throughout the world uh, for his work. Uh, he has uh, recently uh, traveled to speak in Switzerland, uh, in New York City, in Washington, D.C. Uh, the brother is in great demand uh, because he's one of the few people who's talking about, uh, yes, black people will be in the future. And not only will we be in the future, but he's also a person who is prepared with an incredible amount of information and knowledge about what the future will look like, uh, not just for us, but for everybody. And Dr. Uh, Anderson uh, is the author of uh, more than 25 publications. Uh, he has uh, three books, if my memory is correct. I don't have his... Uh, information right in front of me, so, but I do know that uh, he is respected highly. Uh, he is associate editor of the Journal of Black Studies. He is editorial director for a publishing house. Uh, he has m received many awards and, and many recognitions. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are delighted uh, that he is, uh, uh, has agreed to be with us today and to give us this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, he is loved and appreciated by his students at Temple University, uh, where he's an associate professor. So uh, I'm going to uh, just make one comment, and that is that uh, we will be able to uh, ask him questions. He will give us a presentation, and then uh, we will have a few minutes for uh, questions from you as well as any questions we have from uh, the YouTube audience. Uh, but remember, mark your calendar for April the 23rd uh, for uh, Dr. James McIntosh from New York, uh, the head of Simotap. And at this time, uh, it is with great honor and great pride that we invite Dr. Rinaldo. <laughs> Oh, man, appreciate that great introduction. Uh, what this book here, I want to show you all. Um, oh, okay, they can't see this yet. This yet. Oh, they can? Yeah. All right. Um, I would just say learn Afrofuturism as swiftly as you can. This book was produced by the Smithsonian. That's a branch of the federal government. So they believe that it exists. You know, when people argue or debate, once they've acknowledged with a line item in a budget that this phenomenon that has emerged in this century is what we say it is, they're looking at it. Uh, I was recently at an event. They opened up the exhibition, Afrofuturism, A History of Black Futures, which is the culmination of literally 10 years of work by myself and others. Uh, they had people from the White House there, uh, several congressmen, and so they're seriously looking at this as a, a 21st century uh, black phenomenon, not just black America, but a phenomenon that goes across the Atlantic to Africa as a, as a, as a part of analysis. Now, my role in it, I'm probably the primary scholar that establishes its link from our school of thought to Afrocentricity, because I talk about Afrofuturism uh, as a place of how we locate ourselves in space and time with agency. And we were doing this, the ancestors were doing this for centuries. For example, a good exemplar 
is somebody like Benjamin Banneker, who a lot of people now, I always tell people, because you know, sometimes our people are impressed by Europeans. Mm -hmm. Even European scholars say Benjamin Banneker could, was probably establishing astrotheology, looking at the stars and forecasting futures, and was a critic of Thomas Jefferson in terms of what Jefferson tried to say about black people in Notes on Virginia. And of course, people that knew Banneker knew that what Jefferson's saying was nonsense, but I don't want to belabor the point and give too much credit to the founding fathers that were a, a collection of contradictions themselves when it came to black people. Prop, but however, uh, in a literary sense, uh, the first person that I have here on the screen here, what you're looking at is Martin Delaney. And I think it's a lot of time, uh, people are showing more appreciation for Delaney now than was even deserved when I was coming through graduate school. He's not only a person that knew military science, because he was a major in the Union Army. He also practiced medicine, was involved. He's from Pittsburgh, I believe. Mm -hmm. Was helping out with the pandemic. Was admitted and later rejected from Harvard Medical School because some of the white students complained. He was an explorer. Uh, he could be considered probably one of the first Americans to accurately talk and write about Medunetcher. And he was doing that an argument against a European scholar to talk about Medunetcher. So this is a multifaceted individual dealing with humanities, science, history, philosophies of history, also um, articulated the black, pace, the, pla the black presence in Freemasonry all of this going on in the course of his lifetime and he's an explorer and was uh he was kind of like marcus garvey before marcus garvey to a certain extent in the 19th century and he's considered in the literary sense a forerunner to what we call afrofuturism also because in his book that i have up there profiled in the slide blake or the huts of america of the huts of america he's forecasting the establishment of a powerful black nation state now Eurocentric scholars have tried to criticize, well, he was this or that. But I think what Delaney recognized at the time, and they were in his generation was inspired by the Haitian Revolution, that black people would never be free unless they had control or access to some type of nation state that represented their interest. And so before the Civil War, he wrote a series of essays that are later collected into this book talking about this in this pre-Civil War movement in the 1840s and 50s that bears a lot of resemblance to a kind of what's happening in the country now, that the country at that time no longer could stay as it was or retain the status quo. So he puts out these series of articles, and they're really in opposition to um, the author of the, that put out the book Uncle Tom's Cabin. You know, Uncle Tom's Cabin tries to render black people as long-suffering and patient and so forth, so he's presenting an alternative. The other thing is, I always, uh, 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 some of my colleagues have always talked about how you really shouldn't be talking about Frederick Douglass without Martin Delaney. Martin Delaney, in a, in a generic sense, was kind of the Malcolm X to the MLK experience of, of Frederick Douglass uh, in terms of at one time they could work together, but later they had their differences. And Delaney was a steadfast black African-American internationalist and a precursor to a lot of these concepts that we talk about now. W.E.B. Du Bois. They talk about him in the book that I just sent you. Du Bois talks about, for him, literature or fiction functions in a way to make his social science clearer and more acceptable. It's what we do as teachers sometimes when we're explaining a theory and then we present an illustration that goes with that theory. Like if we were talking about the oppression of black men mid 20th century, but then we use the literary illustration of native son to talk about the theory. And that's why Du Bois believed in literature and art and the arts as a way of deepening analysis and being able to explain his work to a broader audience. And some of his work was unpublished at the time. Uh, he has a, he's a social scientist. One of his first major works, The Philadelphia Negro, which um, I've only lived here a year and a half, and I've talked to my family wonder, wondering how Du Bois' analysis of how he looked at Philadelphia, does it, how does it hold up 100 and what, maybe 30 years later after he does the analysis in terms of 
the relative power and disposition of black life in Philadelphia. The Souls of Black Folk, where at this stage in his career, Du Bois is uh, influenced by German philosophy because he had gone to school in Germany and Berlin for a while and was looking at how Germany had produced a modern nation state out of a collection of German speaking principalities and duchies around a philosophy that would later, because Germany did not exist 200 years ago. It was just <laughs> Germanic speaking peoples. And one of the things I realized when I was in Switzerland, the majority of people in Switzerland speak German. It's really like Southeast Germany to a certain extent, even though they would probably fiercely debate that, which is why you could understand Hitler saying, look, if I could go into these other countries and fashion a greater Germany, this is what he's looking at. And maybe he does not invade Switzerland because they are a German speaking country and they're his bankers on certain elements. So people always wonder why did Germany never invade Switzerland? Well, they're the same people to a certain extent. I think I think their states are called cantons and they only have a few Swiss speaking cantons of predominantly German speaking people. However, the book that I really uh, like the most from him is probably Darkwater, Voices from Within the Veil. This is where he publishes a short story called The Comet, which uh, Cherie Renee Thomas and others read as science fiction. And what Du Bois says a hundred years ago in the wake of the Spanish flu pandemic, you know, another pandemic, the only time white people and black people tend to even try to interact as human beings is in the face of a catastrophe. But after the crisis has gone away, the status quo returns. Mm -hmm. He said, and that's, and when you think about what happens in this country, we might have something really bad happen. I'm old, I'm, as I'm getting up here, I remember 9-11. And then after 9-11, Katrina. And then after it seems after every crisis, we can talk to each other for a short period of time, but then we go back to whatever that status quo structure is. And that's why Du Bois lets people know by the 20s, America pretty much can't change. And he uses a, a story to illustrate that. And then that he talk, he has a chapter that deals with what he calls the souls of white folk, where he's really describing why uh, my interpretation of it is, why certain classes of white Americans don't like educated black people. And I remember, I didn't understand that deeply. I remember my grandfather saying that, my father saying why sometimes poor white people hate an educated black person when they see that. And he uses that essay to talk about the souls of white folk when he says that sentence. And they know that I know they don't know what they're talking about. And they hate him because they know that I know. <laughs> and so uh, these are examples of books, the social science, the, the poetry and the, uh, and, this, uh, and the science fiction collectively from these works that inform what we would later call Afrofuturism, where we take from social science, literature, um, uh, aesthetics, and art to collectively forecast the future. The next person I want to talk about as a forerunner, Pauline Hopkins, Of One Blood. This story is kind of like a Wakanda before Wakanda. She's talking about an African-American person of a mixed background who discovers an ancient African civilization in East Africa uh, at the time. And Pauline Hopkins at that time was probably the best-selling author in black America at that time, sold more than anybody else at the time. Her book of One Blood still in circulation as well as Souls of Black Folk. And, and was the most widely read um, author at that time. Now, we didn't they didn't call it Afrofuturism at the time. It's the same way, you know, when we do something creative, we just create something and people sometimes come along and brand it as such in terms of where certain types of names come from. Now, the conflict and confusion sometimes comes in. I think uh, when I was, and this is where my work is. I'm bringing in the impact and discussion of the Temple School, as it was called, the Temple Circle, a generation ago. At the end of the Cold War, there was a black feminist theorist talking about the race for theory. Because from 1945 to 1990, we were in the Cold War. Communism versus capitalism democracy versus non-democracy. And so some of the theories that were dealt with at that time were pretty much locked in because of this geopolitical struggle between the Soviet Union and the United States. However, at towards the end of the Cold War, 
there were a generation of scholars that started to be introduced into the academy. Uh, as far as Europeans, this is where my generation, we're all of a sudden told uh, we have to study people like Derrida, post-structuralism, uh, or post-modernism. And these are theories that really are kind of there to accompany the emergence of what people would call neoliberalism. And when, I'm, and, and I, always I usually make fun of the French scholars because I think some people say they haven't done anything well since Napoleon lost Waterloo, so they had to find something else to do. However, during this same period is where you see the emergence of a generation of black scholars like uh, Malefi Kiti Asante, um, Bell Hooks, Cornell West, because their country is trying to find up with a new set of ideas to help it understand its social life. And that's during this late 80s where I believe Malefi Asante's book, uh, Afrocentricity, A Theory of Social Change. And then it was followed by Comet, his book on Comet, Afrocentricity and Knowledge. And there was another book dealing with aesthetics that him and uh, Karimu Washa Sente published. So I always say between, I always bracket the Africological tradition that would later influence Afrofuturism. A lot of that work was published between 87 and 93 at that time, prior to the internet. Because at that time, Afrocentricity, because I saw Afrocentricity was also embraced by the hip hop community. And at the same time, uh, as it was rising in the influence, and this is pre-internet, because the internet doesn't go live until 95, I would have argued that Afrocentricity and Afrofuturist genesis in an American context is rooted in what Afrocentricity was doing before 1995, because all the work is there. C.T. Keto's work, where he talks about an African-centered view of history and the chapter where he deals with futurologists, the work of, uh, of, of the other Temple Circle scholars that collectively form a part of a, liter a view of literature before something, it was called Afrofuturism. However, I always tell, as I've told my students at the time, the Africological scholars at that time did not have the access to some of the mainstream publications to present their argument. They couldn't get their arguments into Time Magazine or even in certain university presses. So they had to do what we always do. They either had to self-publish or they had to go, or Third World Press, because I remember I was the generation, go to the black bookstore and look for Third World Press mm -hmm. <laughs> or our Black Classic Press. I think Paul Coates puts that out. And that's where we went and got our books, at the little black bookstores in all the communities across the country. And that's how we became aware of the Temple Circle. And so this is why uh, Barbara Christensen talks about this period being the race for theory. And so I don't know, some people might call it the race for the new brainwashing, the race for whatever you want to call it, but she declared this as the race for theory. Sankofa, return, engage, and bring it here. So part of what we've been doing the last 10 years in the movement is how do we go back, return, engage, and bring it forward? Because a lot of us remember that up until the mid to late 90s, Afrocentricity was on the ascendance, but then things happened where they tried to promote alternative ideas with people that weren't connected to the community that we should probably pay attention to. So that's why this struggle of the Afrocentric school of thought as it relates to the black future is going to be in contention with other perspectives. Now, the period of what this period where war was declared over 30 years ago, remember 92 when they said we're in the culture wars. Mm -hmm. What we see now is this anti book banning stuff is an illogical extension of what they declared in the 1990s as culture wars. So I don't know why people act in surprise. Well, and technically speaking, it can philosophically be made. They declared war on us as soon as they brought us over here. Even in their own philosophical traditions, they say, if you enslave another person, you are therefore at war with that person. Mm -hmm. And when we begin to understand that we are in a four to 500 year war, you begin to think differently in terms of what do you need to do moving forward? And that's why I always, one of my favorite passages from, passages from Malcolm X is you left your mind in Africa. <laughs> and so, you know, if you bring your mind forward to the present, you understand, oh, we're really at war. There is no peace. And whether it's Afrocentricity, black power will never make peace with white supremacy. And once people understand that, 
you can begin to behave in a logical, rational manner where people, you might, they might not like you, but they will respect you. They'll think, oh, they're thinking clearly now. Um, Pat Robertson said, it is a cultural war as critical to the kind of nation we shall be as was the Cold War itself, for this war is for the soul of America. They said culture. It was not a war about capital or science, culture war. And Afrocentricity is the preeminent idea in the academy that deals with culture, which is why it's, it's usually try to under, undermine so much even 40 years after the work comes out. Because once you tell people or black people, hey, you are in a culture war, they begin to move a little bit differently. These were some of the books that are influenced in our background to understanding how we're using Afrofuturism. Uh, as I previously mentioned, African-Centered Perspective of History by Keto. Malcolm X as Cultural Here and the other essays that were in that volume, and then Commit Afrocentricity and Knowledge. If you see spaceships and pyramids, that's telling you that <laughs> where the stuff is being drawn from, but they don't want to call it that. They do everything in a circuitous way to say it's everything not an Africological phenomenon. And that's where the struggle is and the, uh, the, the forthcoming battle is in the academy now uh, to represent the, the African perspective in Afrofuturism. I think we were able to defend it pretty well in the volume, but even when you go and see the exhibition, and I think it's a beautiful exhibition, they spent a lot of money put it together, they got to kind of soften up some distinctions in it, or I guess what Malcolm X would say, uh, have, have any of you all had, have, raise your hand if you've had Ethiopian coffee. Okay, put it this way, and you know how strong that coffee is, right? Mm -hmm. Well, in this time, I think they, they might have put a little bit of cream in it, <laughs> in terms of so that the Afrofuturism is maybe not the way we would talk about it necessarily, but then that's where you understand political realities, budgets, and so forth in terms of what is politically doable sometimes. Um, and so I hope up to this point I'm establishing the Africological tradition that supports modern Afrofuturism in the 21st century. The appearance of the internet. Now, a lot of us like me, shoot, I'm 30 years old when the web comes online. Learning how to use emails, you're seeing platforms come out. Um, Anna Everett in 2002 talks about the revolution will be digitized, Afrocentricity and the digital public sphere. That's in writing. Uh, and she's a communication scholar. Keto explains in his book, in 93, before Mark Derry calls or brands something Afrofuturism, she, he says, as a futurologist, she or he can speculate, engage beyond the next century to create in sharp contrast a time map on which to trace the events of the past, create history through action in the present, and plot the path of possible future action. So you're in Africology, you're supposed to be drawn upon Keto, not Mark Derry. He published it before Derry, a full year before that, and was even talking about it in an earlier draft of his book. Now, Africologists, we're supposed to be trained about how to go reclaim and revise the information that's been presented on us. And this is what is circulating from the Temple Circle, early 90s, late, late 80s. So when, at the time, as a graduate student, I was heavily invested in doing a dissertation on the, or writing a dissertation on the Black Panther Party, but I always said I was going to revisit what they were talking about because at this time, and they tell you themselves, people that were using the word Afrofuturism had no philosophical grounding at all. They were all over the place. They had a word that they were dealing with. Some of them just thought of it as black science fiction. Other people were thinking of music because of the album colors of, you remember those Parliament Funkadelic, yes, yes. <laughs> those Parliament <laughs> Funkadelic album colors, yes. Sun Ra, but there was no philosophical grounding. Uh -huh. So the purpose of our movement the last 10 years, we were the first one, in my opinion, to give it a philosophical framework, which is tied to Africology. 2015, in the wake of the killing of Michael Brown, I remember I was at St. Louis at the time, this is where you begin to see 
uh, this, the, this current wave of Afrofuturists begin to come together in terms of translating into political action through art, aesthetics, and so on. And there was a meeting at Princeton at the time that was organized by Ruha Benjamin. Uh, within weeks of this meeting in 2015, uh, John Jennings and I co-curated an exhibition in Harlem, New York at the Schomburg Center for the Study of Black Life, and it was called Unveiling Visions, where we brought together uh, black and African artists from across the diaspora to present this vision of an alternative future showing that black people would be in the future. And it was really also, and I'll say it of the artist, was that I helped develop it as an alternative division to what the Obamas were talking about. And that was my main purpose. And I know several years ago, you didn't get a lot of fans if you criticized the Obamas, but uh, from reading some of my elder stuff, you can't do what's popular sometimes. You have to do what's necessary. Mm -hmm. And people will respect your stance for it later. So contemporary Afrofuturism, and this wave we're in now, and I am the unacknowledged author and writer and descriptor and writer, and we have a book on it. Uh, we're saying Afrocentric meta theory is involved with this with agency location versus dislocation. It's an African-centered geography of reason. So that way we don't get trapped in like a race construct. Okay, but we're just saying in this geography of reason, in history going from the Nile Valley civilization to the present, we have enough archeological evidence, cultural evidence, thematic evidence, aesthetic evidence to base our arguments on. And that's what they would call beyond, you know, within the geography reason, they would say that's ethical. And that's increasingly unchallenged. Afrofuturism 2.0 is a pan-African transnational movement influenced by the emergence of social media digital aesthetics, the formation of the African Union in the middle of the last decade that recognized the diaspora as the sixth zone, which is contested and argued about now. Platform capitalism. When I ask people, to, when they ask me, what is platform capitalism? Uh, some of you, I'll explain it like this. You know during the pandemic how some people didn't leave the house and they ordered DoorDash, Uber Eats, all of that kind of stuff, if they could afford it operating off of these online platforms. Mm -hmm. And I know I participated in it because I, when I moved here, I didn't hardly know anybody and I was so afraid of getting sick. I was having them bring the food to my apartment and I would get in a lift, another form of platform capitalism because I didn't wanna catch COVID and I would take a lift to work for a few weeks at a time. Um, and then confronting uh, biotech and the existential threats facing African people. The United States government said in the last 24 uh, months that white supremacy is now a domestic existential threat to the country. So that tells you who they're looking at, and we don't talk about it enough that January 6th was an act of white supremacy, an existential threat dealing to the democratic choices of black people in America. Because if you recall, they rioted and tried to tear the place up after Raphael Warnock won the Senate in Georgia, giving the power of the Senate to the Democratic Party. Those two things are, are, are linked to each other. The location of African peoples in time and space with agency it currently operates as the high culture of the diaspora. What I mean by that, because some people get uh, worried about use of high or low. I always tell people at any of the Afrofuturist art events, you've never heard of people, you can bring your family to it. No one's getting shot. You don't have to worry about security. We're trying to promote the best, that the best representation via art, music, science of people of African descent. Now, traditionally that's called high culture. Okay, and so that's why, why it can exist in other formats, but we choose to promote the best of um, what African people can produce because there's so much negative stuff about, out there about black people. So, so if they want to say we're snobby, I accept that title with honor because there's too much popular culture stuff that they glorify in that portrays us in very negative ways. The first dimension I want to talk about, metaphysics, or what they would call ontology, um, meaning or existence. 
or an epistemological or truth uh, functional aspects of knowledge. Now that's embedded in African philosophies or what we call African-American philosophies, uh, metaphysics, how we think about the universe, our place within the universe. And this is one of the hardest things that I know that Africology, uh, people who want to have a healthy sense of black identity deal with, because I always remember something John Henry Clark said, if your God does not look like you in your imagination, you're in a sad place. And to me, that's why, I mean, one of the things I would always, as a parent of generation Zoomers, those are kids born in the last 22 years, I would openly have to say at the dinner table, I would use humor mixed with politics uh, in terms of when you have a, to negotiate public education and helping your young people understand it. And the, an example I'll give in St. Louis, because the schools were so bad, a lot of them, we had to send our kids to private school. And sometimes the only private school available is a Catholic school. And so my children, I would explain to them why you, there is no need for you to respect that institution. I said they were the ones that underwrote and legitimized the transnational slave trade. Us attending that school is strictly a business decision. He's just a white man with a pointy hat. I've been to the Vatican. Half the stuff in there is stolen and plundered or whatever, uh, symbolically. And it's built on, a te I believe, a place that used to be dedicated to Mithra. And when you go in the Vatican and tour it, it seems to be more stuff related to the occult or antiquity than it is about Christianity. So they got a pretty good thing going on in terms of getting people to make pilgrimages there and spend money. And so I said, we are, you are only in that place to get math, science, read, writing, or whatever, but your values come from this house. And that's what we stand on in this house. So you never come to my table and make this sign or whatever. We don't have anything to do with that. Our relationship with them is purely transactional. Okay. And, that, and I think I said that eloquently enough without being accused of anything, bringing in the historical analysis and so forth. And, that's, and so that's how that metaphysics in the Anderson household looks like. Or I use a humorous one from the boondocks where they said, God is black, Jesus is black, and Ronald Reagan was the devil. <laughs> and so, um, and so in, 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 a, in a practical sense. So this is one of the things that uh, metaphysics is one of the hardest things we got to work with other people. And I don't leave out my critique as, as, as Dr. Asante and Dr. Dove put in their book, Human Being Human. Most of the world's major religions are anti-black in their metaphysics, whether it's Hinduism, uh, the, all of the Abrahamic faith traditions, and Hindu are anti-black at their core. And they, are, they clearly understand that. And so that's why I have no problems whatsoever telling people. Uh, and I'll get this towards the end talking about, I think the bigger threat now is not from Christianity, but from another one of the Abrahamic faith traditions at the moment. Uh, because I don't pull punches when I have to deal with Arab racism towards black Africans either. So um, metaphysics. A second dimension, aesthetics, which is what we're big on and known for, where we deal with art, music, literature, performance. Like as a kid, I remember going to the Parliament Funkadelic Park concerts that they used to have at the DC Armory. Uh, Black American speculative literature. Uh, these are performance and art produced by African peoples. Now, that this dimension is fine. I like the aesthetics, but all too often, we don't control the business behind the aesthetics. Yeah. Because one of the things, and this is where I think the, this, the, the capitalistic thing comes into play, where I remember as an undergraduate student being involved with hip hop at the time in the late 80s, I was trained how to promote shows, meet, uh, uh, put all this stuff together. And we're doing this as like 20 something year old young people, but we had no elders to, tell, to show us how to make it a business. So I always tell people, for me, hip hop was really over with by the mid to late 90s because we weren't really calling any shots anymore because other people had come in and put in the institutions to take control of it away from the community. Um, let me. Symbols of power, even at Maryland, this is an, uh, a gentleman of African descent showing how the Adinkra symbols are tied to think how we think about physics. 
in terms of theoretical and applied science. So the, in the, at this dimension where you're dealing with archaeology, math, chemistry, biology, astronomy, and applied air, computer science has an African perspective to it in terms of how to think about, uh, Sophia Umoja talks about in the book, Algorithms of Oppression, how it comes down to algorithms. And in this dimension, uh, I know going back two generations, Africologists, I can't think of the name, have talked about the need we should be embracing and in investigating the impact on science with our culture a lot more. And they've been having this talk since the 70s. I believe at the first Black Studies Department, they even had a class that dealt with uh, blacks and science in it at San Francisco State, I believe it was introduced. And so, and science is really the field that we're going to have to deal with here going forward because in the last five years, there's a fewer, there are fewer numbers of black kids going into STEM now. So what we're, they, because all these laws they're passing, they're trying to make schools and institutions afraid of having programs to encourage black people into science. At the very moment in history, they're moving into all these advanced scientific fields like biotech and these other um, phenomena that are emerging now. And we got to keep an eye on that uh, in terms of why all of a sudden are they trying to push young black people out of science at the current moment. And then the dimension of social science, politics. Uh, this semester, we're in an African philosophy, philosophical class that we're talking about, we're dealing with uh, the political philosophies of people like Kwame Ture, or T Ture uh, Julius Nairiri, Kwame Nkrumah, in terms of the social sciences, also talking about Diop's influence on knowledge and how it's tied into philosophy in social sciences, anthropology, psychology, political science, and history. We're bringing all these together that inform what we're creating in relation to Afrofuturism. And then finally, the programmatic piece. Um, uh, last year at Carnegie Hall, there was a two-month <coughs> program of Afrofuturism in New York City. And so that, I think that has impacted the East Coast because now a year later we're seeing this exhibition at uh, the African American History Museum. And then I found out by accident someone who's using my ideas for an exhibition at the Reginald Lewis Museum in Baltimore that opened last week where they say, yeah, we got this from Ronaldo Anderson with a quote on the brochure from me. So now up and down the East Coast now, the work that we've been doing the last couple of years now seems to be bearing fruit. And maybe because now we're coming out of the pandemic, people are ready to start pushing and moving the ideas forward. Uh, here in Philadelphia, and a group that was important to this work uh, that was done by Rashida Phillips and Kame Devstar, known as More Mother in the Black Quantum Futurist Collective, were important to this work. Uh, I, they still maintain their, ho their home in Philadelphia. But they, I know Kame, she, they have her teaching at USC or UCLA now, the concepts that I'm talking about here in relation to her musical production. Uh, I previously mentioned this earlier, the exhibition that promoted these ideas uh, that was at the Schomburg and, uh, in 2015. And I met one of the archivists that's there at the Schomburg last night uh, when I was giving a talk at Medgar Evers College. Uh, they're going to be probably exploring some of these concepts several years later. These are the, do the books that kind of form the foundations of what we do, Afrofuturism 2.0 and the Black Speculative Arts Movement text, which kind of should be read as companion volumes. And our practice and agency, we put together a movement to advance our ideas the same time that we started these exhibitions because Afrofuturism now operates three-dimensionally. We've had the, the theories and ideas and activities that we do, but now it operates cura in curated exhibitions. But the third dimension that's emerged in the last 18 months now, our think tanks are engaging it. Uh, a year and a half ago, I participated in a program with the N-Square Think Tank. They deal with nuclear uh, proliferation and peace. And we were able to, uh, through a, an activity they call horizon scanning, and it surprised them and it didn't surprise me, where after they collected all the data from our activities when we were talking about a black future, they compared what we were talking about to what nuclear proliferation and peace people talk about, and it was two fundamentally different perspectives. 
And they're like, we don't know what that's called. I said, that's called an African worldview, sister. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what you all basically did there and why we think about peace and security different from Amen. this group over here. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, you want to want to talk about nuclear weapons. We're talking about, you know, can my people get some drinking water in Jackson, Mississippi? <laughs> before we get to the nuclear stuff. So that's the kind of stuff where they figured out, they show that they're, that we have a unique worldview, hence why the government has to acknowledge with all that money putting the exhibition on in the, um, in the uh, Smith, as a part of the Smithsonian. Uh, other examples, uh, uh, one of our students has an online school, uh, Michelle Taylor, uh, Sankofa Summer School. And increasingly, one of the things they talked about during the pandemic was the emergent where I think it's a quiet, I think of it as like a quiet rebellion where black people are no gonna, longer going to accept how our kids are educated in public schools. So they're looking at alternatives now to prepare them to be adults because clearly what has been going on, I was a teacher in the eighth grade middle school during the era of George Bush's um, no child left behind. People got left behind anyway. Mm -hmm. And now it's in many ways worse because they don't even know how to come to school with critical thinking skills or writing skills. Mm -hmm. And the fact that some of the people that were teaching, they might not have had a certification, but they knew how to teach. And some of the people that are certified don't know how to teach. Mm -hmm. And some of them, and so that has led to a another set of problems. In turn, and the example I always give is literacy. Uh, when I was an eighth grade teacher, I was big on black male literacy. A lot of times black males lose interest in reading by fifth, sixth grade. You know, although at the third grade, everyone's on the same level. And as an eighth grade teacher, I figured out since most teachers that teach English are white women, they're not teaching our kids what they're interested in reading about. In one year, I remember the last year before I finished my Ph.D., there were tears involved. They were sad to see me go. <laughs> but the principal told me in one year I would have been able to, I think we had a, called something called a map test. And I had been able in one year to raise the reading score from a zero to a two, simply because for uh, during the reading period that everybody was supposed to be reading in the school, I let the black males, a lot of them wanted to read Donald Goins books. And I got permission from the parents. I said, I looked at it, look, it's not my job to get to you to nirvana or heaven. My job is to get you to a point where you know how to fill a job application, a resume, and deal with literacy. And when you let people read what they want to read, they take ownership of the work. And then it becomes, I'm doing my work. I'm not doing Mr. Anderson's work. It's not perceived as a chore. And so, and when I went to a local, uh, teacher education function for St. Louis Public Schools. And I, I mentioned to one of the uh, teachers that I'm not going to teach um, this particular novel that's based upon a sharecropper and a crime in Alabama. I remember one of the protagonists is Scout. I can't think of the name of the novel. Um, oh, man. And I told the instructor at the time, I said, you know why you like teaching our kids that stuff? Because you're really teaching because you identify with the white protagonist so you can be the hero in your own mind mm -hmm. <laughs> teaching this novel because that's your kind of way of showing your, rather than having, letting the students read things that show African-American agency mm -hmm. in the novel. And that's how you're undermining their interest. Of course, you got really mad about it, but I did not withdraw my, my assertion but that's why a lot of our kids lose interest in reading simply because the materials presented to them do not present them where they see agency and that's why you see so many young people say i do certain things because i don't see myself living past the age of 21. it's not that complicated um africa and its diaspora are organizing around a lot of what we're talking about uh recently in the last year the strongest growth we've had is what some scholars call the global south, meaning Brazil. Uh, in several weeks, I'm going to be attending a, a, a big meeting they're organizing in Colombia in the city of Medellin. Um, a lot of the other part that caught me by surprise was how quickly interested the French speaking African Muslims are interested in this, where they're taking Afrofuturism, reggae music, 
and African indigenous culture and putting it in opposition to religious extremism imposed by the Arabs and French cultural imperialism in opposition to that. And I was like, man, I never thought of that configuration and taking on that configuration like that. Uh, four pillars for an Africological leadership. We have to look at what's happening with technology. We have to become familiar with strategic foresight, understand where things are going, and the insight to understand why things are happening, and then the oversight, like with a GPS, look from above and see how all of this is connected. We're now in a multipolar world. Uh, what's happening now, uh, since I last talked to you all, um, we're going to see a lot of negative things happen over the next 18 months because in the war of you, you, in Ukraine, the European land war, has led to the unraveling of what people, of the world that people knew during globalization. Most people in the academy aren't prepared for it because most people in the academy, most politicians, we are all educated during the age of globalization. And we were not taught how to deal with deglobalization. So that means all those political agreements, economic agreements that created globalization are coming apart. And one function of the war that's happening now is because the Ukrainian wheat crop, which the UN food uh, agencies would get to feed poor countries, is not available. Uh, as one of my students who just returned from Cairo, they're already starving in certain neighborhoods in Egypt. Uh, they're already hungry in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and East Africa. So now some of us older remember, and I remember in the 70s when we used to see people in East Africa starving to death. So they're thinking we're going to see some of that now by this fall. Uh, famine. And then a lot of people don't realize, and I would, I'm ex-military, that a lot of globalization and why we get these cheap uh, clothes that from China or Taiwan, that was guaranteed by the American Navy. The American Navy had hundreds of destroyers to guarantee the transportation of goods and services. If you take the American Navy out of the equation, then the companies that insure ships will drive up the insurance so it's no longer cheap to ship things. Mm -hmm. So that means it's no longer economically viable to move products, some of them by ship. So it's going to drive up the cost. And that's food, clothing, a lot of stuff that we used to get inexpensively is going to go up simply because the insurance to insure those ships will go up. Also, uh, the energy issue. Because Russia's war and what's happening to them with embargoes, they no longer have the infrastructure or people to maintain their energy infrastructure, probably about $5 million worth of Russian crude will get off the market in the next two years. So we're going to see increased higher cost of barrels of oil for Europe, where it'll go up maybe maybe $200 a barrel, something like that. And so they're going to, and that's going to impact then the manufacturing base of those countries when you don't have the petrol to deal with the manufacturing piece, which then means why uh, they'll draw more on North America temporarily to get its energy from. And that's why Joe Biden went to Africa to give them about $50 million in energy infrastructure. So they're going to turn towards Africa for, to get their energy instead of Russia. However, they're going to probably leave in pay, place the corrupt African kleptocrats that are in charge in a lot of those countries that other people, I think that scholar Shin Wazoo wrote about the West and the rest of us. So you're going to see certain African elites continue the corrupt behavior because now that the West needs energy from Africa, but it takes about three to five years to modernize uh, energy infrastructure. So Europe's going to be in a tight spot the next few years. Um, the other thing that's happening as America is trying, we're getting ready to go back to a neo-mercantilist kind of system. So what is happening in plain sense, what they used to call the trilateral countries, they are also forming an economic system that is insulated from the rest of the world. So Japan, North America, including Mexico, and parts of Western Europe are going to have a neo-mercantilist economic structure that's insulated from the problems of the rest of the world. And that's why in the last few weeks, you've seen China come up what they're calling um, uh, where uh, it's called something plus um, BRICS plus. 
the BRIC countries of Brazil, Russia, India, China. They're forming BRICS Plus, trying to bring in more countries, and that's in China's interest because American citizens underwrote Chinese development where we moved a lot of stuff over there the last couple of generations, but Biden's recent bill on chip manufacturing is bringing it back here. And so China will no longer be able to put together the high-end chip manufacturing around electronics because China's Navy is not that good. It wasn't good when I was in the Navy. Most of their ships can't sail more than a few hundred miles from China. Uh, the American Navy by itself is about 10 times stronger than the rest of the world by itself. When you add in the Japanese Navy, who have now been authorized to rearm, and the British Navy, nobody can challenge that in the world. And so China is in a race against time to put together these relationships to keep its own manufacturing and industrial base going in the way that all these agreements are come unraveling in this new multipolar world. So my thing is, as a person of African descent, I have no vested interest in seeing what a positive outcome for China or the West, I want to know what are we going to get out of it and are we even asking the right questions? You know, and so that's why it's bigger and beyond the reparations debate at the moment. And I don't hear any African leaders talking about what is the geostrategic position of African people in a multipolar world. I'm like, where are our Kwame Nkrumahs? Where are our Seiko Toure's? Where are our Julius Nairis? They don't exist at the moment. And so right now there's kind of like a, uh, a, a pause at the moment where everyone's looking at each other trying to figure out what's happening. And I had an a, a, a intellectual in New York um, approach me and ask me about, uh, about Africans or, or people of African descent and the Ukrainian war. I said, that's a European argument. We have nothing to do with that. Amen. So you have to show people of African descent. They, Africans like the Russians and the Chinese because the Russians and Chinese are giving them the weapons to fight the extremists in the Sahara. And that's why, and, and uh, I believe Burkina Faso and Mali are trying to come together and be federate. I believe that's what Thomas Sankara was trying to do. Uh, I mean, so the news is happening fast. Every few days now you're seeing Africans now want to delink from the CIFA currency of France. And so I'm happy to see that, you know, um, that the, uh, because Africa, it, it, most people didn't realize how Africa was still colonized through currency. And so that's what the challenge for Afrofuturism and Africology is now. How do we function in a multipolar world? Because if we as Africologists don't come up with the solutions, how we deal in the multipolar world, other people will try and advance ideas and concepts that are not in our best interest. Some of these challenges deal with quantum computing, biotech, which is coming in fast. We haven't even had a chance to get to climate change. And, um, and in terms of what must we do going forward, um, uh, I was talking with Dr. Sante when he visited the cl my class recently of even how we even think of uh, Africa in our imagination now. North Africa is clearly made it apparent with the behavior of the president of Tunisia, they do not want black people in their country. Now, because I'm not, uh, I come from a different, I'm cut from a different cloth and I always have a long memory. Scientists have already said that part of Africa is gonna be uninhabitable in a few generations. So my thing is them like, the way you treat us now, we're gonna remember and whatever, and you might have to start building some underground cities because you can't come south, you know, in terms of, of, of uh, because that's the biggest piece of meat left on the global table now is Africa. It's underpopulated, has a lot of the world's remaining uh, natural resources that are necessary to even get to a green tech revolution or whatever. And so uh, that's the question mark uh, I have for whether people that claim to be African leaders in the diaspora on the continent um, what is to be done? And I will end uh, the presentation right there and I'll take questions. Thank you for. Um, yeah. Thank you, bro. Okay. All right. Uh, thank, thank you, brother. Thank you very much. All right. We, we have um, a time for questions. And let me just say one. one a note that I want to mention because it was so powerful, this uh, lecture uh, that Dr. Anderson uh, gave. 
that um, the, the inroad, the path uh, from the north to uh, the uh, more uh, habitable regions of the continent of Africa, uh, right now, uh, that pathway is through Sudan and, that is, and through the Nile River Valley. And that is one of the ways that uh, uh, we are seeing this notion of the expansion of the Arab world, uh, particularly where they are removing uh, uh, African people uh, and bringing in people from Syria and Iraq and other places to put them into Sudan and into various other parts of uh, Africa, in e including even Upper Egypt. So, so th that's something that we have to watch. We have to be careful. We know historically that the, the struggle is long and that there are always uh, formations uh, being formed to undermine uh, African people. So, so we want to give credit and thanks. And we're going to, at this time, ask Dr. Jabali Ade if he would uh, handle the mic for the questions for our outstanding speaker. Thank you. I have uh, not necessarily a question, but a request. What about uh, making available? What about making available the uh, the speech today? <laughs> The, the, the speech is on YouTube. Yeah, it's on YouTube. You'll be able to see it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, fantastic uh, lecture, Dr. Anderson. I certainly appreciated it. And you pretty much answered my question because what we we're going to uh, ask is have you heard of the New World Order and have you heard of the Great Reset? I've heard of both of those. Right. So, and so but my question was how would Africa fit into that whole? Pa uh, you know, uh, uh, panorama or, or the whole paradigm in reference to the Great Reset and the New World Order. But you, you kind of answered the question. Uh, well, you know. I didn't get a chance to that, but here's where I think they're going to have a tough time. See, the thing that's uh, the problem with Europe is right now is they're going through demographic collapse. Mm -hmm. They don't have enough young people. Well, and I went to Yaounde when I was there with Dr. Asante. <laughs> that was the first time in my life I felt like an elderly person. I'm on the street, <laughs> and everybody looks 20 years old. That's right, that's right. And even some of the young people I met there act like they had to help me. And I'm like, wait a minute, I can walk. I don't, know. I don't have a cane. They were calling me uncle and everything. And then when I go to you, to, to, when I was in Switzerland, <laughs> in Switzerland, I fit in. That's, that's like, that looked like Boomerville. You know, all I'm walking around, I was like, look at this. They're older. Africa's younger. And even the young people doing stuff in Europe, most of them look like immigrants mm -hmm. or, or women. And that's why when I travel in Europe, I always tell people the people that are most helpful in the service area are women and immigrants because they're going to be bilingual. A lot, white men over the age of 40 something, they feel like they don't have to learn any other language because of whatever is patriarch or whatever. But, um, I say, yeah, they, and that's where I realize now Europe don't even have the manpower to conquer Africa anymore. They just don't have the bodies anymore. They're running out of people because the, think of it like this. Under their model of the way economics work, it was based upon a pyramid structure. More young people at the bottom, older people at the top. But now because they've killed so much of each other for the last hundred years, they have an upside down pyramid. Not enough young people, too many older people, and young people who are educated and got gifts aren't going to want to keep paying increased taxes to support other people. They're going to be like, I want to go to another country where I'm not taxed as much. You have entire towns in Italy, Moldova, whatever, they're empty. That's why when you go online, they say they're trying to get people to immigrate over there to move in private. It's because they got whole towns of empty. They've all, people have left. And they might live in Rome or Paris or whatever, but you. But if you go out to the, the state of Nebraska, you got entire states where the western part of the state here in the Midwest is literally empty. The average age is people that are 65 years old. Uh, and they're trying, I remember a few years ago, they were trying to auction off an old school property over there because the, the biggest money coming into some of those counties was Social Security because the young people have all left and moved away. Well, Europe... 
didn't realize it kind of killed off itself by going through World War One and World War Two because it killed who goes to war young people. So by and then I only want to bring the Stalin repression. That's why Russia is never going to recover demographically. And so Europe is just getting ready to go down as a demography. Uh, people are arguing the European Union may no longer exist in a couple of generations because there are only two countries in Europe that are demographically stable. That's France and Scandinavia, because they had the foresight to put together welfare state benefits for people having families. The French did it by accident simply because they wanted to have a bigger population in West Germany, and the Scandinavian system had always had be better benefits for ch child having children, but the other countries didn't do what France and Scandinavia did. So those are the two countries in Europe that are not having the issue with demographic collapse. Uh, Germany's best days are behind it. That's why the chancellor, I forget if they call it a president, their leader went to Ghana recently. They're already trying, they're worried about negotiating a second African brain drain mm -hmm. where they'll bring in the best and brightest from around the world to come just to yeah, keep their, right. yeah, they're already doing it. Mm -hmm. And for, you know, for a lot of Africans, they act like, you know, Europe is paved with streets of gold and honey and everything else. So, you know, they're, you know, as one of my friends called the second motherland for some Africans. Mm -hmm. And so, Africa's got to worry about a second brain drain. Uh, and, and I think the bigger threat is not the uh, global reset, it's going to be climate change and what's going to happen if the possible forced Islamization of sub Saharan Africa, when because great populations are moving around. Uh, every year the number increases. Several years ago, a population the size of Italy was on the move every day for water, food, and shelter, and it's just getting bigger and bigger every year. And that's part of what's happened at the southern border in the United States. A lot of those are climate change issues, plus problems exacerbated when I was in the U.S. military, when Reagan, the Reagan administration was pouring in all those guns, Iran-Contra, and all that. We created that the gang problem down there in Central America. So now you have these unintended consequences of bad policy with climate change that will overwhelm whatever they want to do for the Great Reset. Dr. Anderson, thank you, man. That's fantastic, and I really appreciate your work. Uh, I have two quick questions. One as it relates to the education that you pointed, the lack of uh, quality education for our, for our youth. Uh, in my generation, my time, we had freedom schools mm -hmm. in uh, Philadelphia, all across the country, and we recognized exactly what you pointed out, but well, we did go to freedom schools. As an undergraduate at Temple, we taught at freedom schools and had them all across the country. So is your analysis of how we overcome this deficit in education for our youth, particularly uh, involved, involving the enhancement of this online education that you talk, that you mentioned, and how, how fast can it scale up in terms of dealing with these crises that we look well, at every, every day? It can happen fast. I think what's getting ready to happen, black America is going to be offered a deal here in the next few years. Remember what Roosevelt called the New Deal? Um, there were two previous points of history I'm kind of looking at in terms of on the other side of the deal, we came out better than before that deal. The American Civil War, they basically got Frederick Douglass and black folks to go against the Confederacy. You know, when they couldn't work it out amongst themselves and they concluded we need to free up to a quarter million African troops. And that's why I always think of when I hear some of these people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, I say, oh, so you want a replay of the Atlanta where y'all got it, what, extra crispy and hot and spicy? You know, and that wouldn't make a lot of people I know sad, you know, but that, that was a new deal, what they then called Reconstruction. The second time was they needed black manpower to, they needed people of color globally to defeat fascism. Mm -hmm. People keep forgetting sure. the, the French army and British army were Indian and African right. <laughs> that won that war that turned the tide against the Nazis, you know, they had, that's why they had to create Tuskegee Airmen and, and even the Nisei troops. They had to get, it took, every, they took all the people of color they had to defeat the Germans and at that time and the Japanese. So now I think they're at a, a different point in history where they're like, and they're really afraid now in New York, that's what they were talking about. 
their big thing they want to talk about in the high cultural centers of the country is the Weimar Republic, mm -hmm. which was Germany before National Socialism took over. Mm -hmm. They're really concerned about the country drifting towards fascism. So that's the, the people who are fascistic and reactionary ain't thinking about no great reset. They call you a globalist. Right. They hate those people. Right. They, 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 they're saying they want a national divorce. Now, just from my study of military science, all the people that are calling for this reactionary MAGA stuff, the people in the blue areas got more people, more money. Mm -hmm. That's probably going to dictate who's going to win. <laughs> Period. It always does. We got more guns, butter people, and, young, and, and younger, people. younger people. And so that would be the outcome. But they don't want to have to fight because that would probably mean even if they won, America might not be a superpower anymore after that. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to negotiate this thing to where we can have some uncomfortable years ahead, but not have open violence on a mass scale that's disruptive to the business of the United States. And that's kind of where things are. And that's why you see, you know, Joe Biden got more black people in his cabinet than Obama ever had. But then I concluded, if even white Americans don't have enough kids, you can't run the country anymore without black and brown and Asian people. That's why you see so many of them now in positions of, uh, whether it's in science and politics. And when it was presented to me overseas that, well, what about Germany? I said, no. What happened to the people who were killed in Germany in those camps, they represented maybe 1% or 2% of the population. You Just black and brown people here is over 100 million people, and they're not going to go out like that. And so that would not be a good historical analogy. Um, but, yeah, the, uh, the, the best minds that I've run into in the country now are saying we're in a pre-Civil War moment, and that Great Reset book you were talking about the gentleman talked about, that was something thought about in the absence of a fascist movement. They thought that was going to be an opportunity to do an economic reset, but they did not assume how power, how strong the fascistic tendencies around and, and authoritarian tendencies were going to be around the world. Thank you, Doc. Uh, I need, I'm, being a minister, I'm in the people's business, and I need uh, Dr. Smith and Dr. Scientist opinion on this. I think we're being blinded by entertainment and we don't control none of it. And then once I heard a man said the black players down on the court drilling the ball and the white folks up in the office counting the money. So mm -hmm. I don't see no change in it. I don't well, see it. I'll, I'll use something I remember Du Bois wrote in Dark Water and that we have to drive home. Du Bois talked about the concept of a, of a veil how we see America through a veil. And what that veil kind of means is because of white supremacy, uh, white Americans don't see us accurately of who we are as human beings. But the veil for us means we don't see the reality of America. That's why I said the veil cuts both ways. They don't see us as humans and we don't see reality because a whole bunch of our people refuse to deal with reality right. and it shows up in our theology yes. it shows up in how we think that other people are supposed to take care of us yes. Yes. and that's how it works against us so my thing is i want the veil removed that's too right. that's you know right. we that's the part that uh, work because we got a friend of mine talked about we have he called reverend andrew rollins calls it a stepped on theology he said every week where we collect more money and resources where our people could be educated, too many ministers are not even bringing up the African reality in relation to the faith Ooh, tradition. Right. And I mean, he said his job as a specialist, he's 73 years old, his specialty is getting the white Jesus down in every church he goes to preach in. <laughs> and until Absolutely. that reality is dealt with, uh, you know, in terms of understanding that what black Americans really created here was the, fir the world's first anti-racist doctrine of theology. Mm -hmm. But too many ministers, because they want to get invited to the white boys club at the seminary, they all want to say they belong being, we aren't Protestants. The Protestants were protesting the Catholic Church. We protest white people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't pro I'm just saying, we protest racism. We don't protest the Catholic Church. But a Protestant said, we aren't in there talking about Martin Luther and all this other stuff. You know, and so really, we talk about George Wallace, Trump, or whatever, and that, because that's an anti-racist doctrine. That's a, that, and that would be considered a fifth branch of Christianity that black, but see, we all, we, we don't value ourselves enough 
to advance the argument and do what we have to do because too many people in our different fields, whether it's, it's, it's theology, politics, whatever, don't have faith in the capacity of black people to make up their own minds, put the information in their hands, and they'll do what's necessary. And so that's why I've come to believe a lot of people we see on TV are placed there to keep the veil over our eyes uh, that, so that we never see reality, whether they're entertainers, news anchors, and I guess the only analogy I have from Sunday school, they're like the magicians that used to work for Pharaoh, you know, to just keep throwing tricks out there to keep people confused and being able to think and see clearly. And, All right. Yeah. I'm sorry, brother. We just got one question from online. Yep. So okay. a lot of a lot of praise online. They say thank you, Dr. Edison, for such an informative conversation. This con this question is from Tugu Sensauci. <laughs> <laughs> he says, uh, "Can you please uh, give some information about the expansion of uh, Arabism in Mali, Niger, and northern Niger Nigeria?" Well, there's a book I'd recommend people reading. Um, is it's a combination of I would call uh, religious extremism and statecraft. There's a book called from, that Strobe Talbot wrote a generation ago called Statecraft. There are certain countries, uh, uh, whether it's in the Arab Gulf, that finance the extremism that we see that happens in America, because the ability to advance your interests, your political interests in another nation state, they see that as a part of their foreign policy. And, and it is in the foreign policy of certain Arab dominated nation states to keep Africa destabilized. Now the only time they want to be African is when it's in the UN time and they need African votes to be something for them. Okay, and so, and so that's why I, too, I always tell, uh, I've told some of my brothers who are Muslim, I have a lot of respect for the nation of Islam. I don't believe in what they believe in, but at least they created it for black people, you know, at the end of the day. And, you know, and too many of the, uh, it, so when I hear them arguing, I said, you serve in the interest of somebody from the Arab Gulf states you don't even know, you know, with the way you're trying to talk about wh what you believe in. And these people over there despise you. Uh, I mean, when I heard the word abit, a word for slave or whatever, now, um, now, and I saw this when I was in the American military, minding my own business, and I heard that term and that brother had a bad outcome, you know, uh, you know, in terms of trying to tell me I was a slave and I had to, you know, <laughs> do what I had to do. <laughs> and so, so the thing is, and that's why I think that we have to rethink a whole bunch of things of who allies and real friends are. You know, in terms of what that means for our people and how every other group advances this, uh, their interests at our expense a lot of times. And so my thing is I'm open to dialogue, but you have to show how does this relationship benefit me? And if it doesn't, I don't care about it. You can quote some scripture or whatever, but if it's not beneficial to the community, we just need to tell them to get on down the road. All right. Uh, this is what we always do at the Malefic Kete Asante Institute. We have outstanding lecturers, and uh, fine, you can. Uh, just, yeah. And we, we really appreciate uh, Dr. Anderson for his presentation. Just want to make a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, let me just say uh, again a great thanks uh, to you for an outstanding presentation, and we're very, very, very proud to have our brother, our young brother Amin. Uh, Brother Amin here, who's go who going to be working with us as a technology expert, and we really delighted for him uh, to be with us. Those of you who want this, uh, this lecture, you can go to YouTube, and just all you have to put in YouTube is Malefic Kete Asante Lectures, and it, all the lectures that we have given here will pop up, and you can choose the one you want. That's how you have to do it. And uh, I want to uh, reiterate that we have our next speaker is Dr. James McIntosh. We look forward uh, to you uh, coming out to hear Dr. McIntosh uh, also. Uh, those of you who plan to donate or would like to donate to the Malefic 
Malefic Kete Asante Institute, you can do so by going to our website. It's very simple. You have to put it, you, if you start uh, this way, it will immediately pop up. The, T-H-E, M-K-A Institute.com. I think that's it. Yeah. All right. That's it. Thank you very much. So you just go to, but you have to put the, T-H-E, before. Those many people around the world have been t writing to me saying, I can't get the Institute website because they have the old site, which is just Maleficati Asante Institute. But you now have to put T-H-E, the Malefic, uh, the, the M-K-A Institute. Uh, dot com. You start that, and then it will pop up, and you can go to the donate page. Thank you so much for coming. Thank my good brother, Dr. Uh, Kareem, brother Kareem, uh, brother Carlton, who these are brothers who help us technologically and, and in many ways, and all of you who come to this program over and over again, particularly our, uh, our associate director, uh, Dr. Uh, Jabali Adi, Ade, uh, uh, Sister uh, Don Dove, Dr. Ad, uh, Don Dove, they, 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 the people who just support us, uh, uh, our board member members, Dr. Uh, Brother Stan Stroud, I'm going to call everybody doctors. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, Stan Stroud, our board members, uh, uh, Carlton. I mean, we thank you so much. And let me say this that we will continue to grow and develop, and we will continue to speak truth, always to power and anybody else. Those who don't even have power, we speak truth to them as well. We call upon our ancestors far and near, the mother of our mothers, the father of our fathers, to render mercy and to bear witness for the liberation and the victory of all oppressed people. Forever it is done. Oh, man.